Well, what's up, 1215 service? You guys are looking fly today, looking good. Turn to your neighbor and say, you look good today. You look extra good. Turn to your second choice, and just because you wanted to hold off on them, and just say, you look extra smooth and fly today. Well, my name's Troy Maxwell. I am the senior pastor here, and I'm excited. How many of y'all have finished all of your Christmas shopping? Raise your hand if you've finished all your Christmas shopping. How many of y'all got, got to go right after church today and go do some Christmas shopping? Good luck. Um, let me just winch in one word, Amazon. I love Amazon. I love some Amazon Prime. I mean, I, I you know, because what I love about Amazon is it's almost as if you are getting a present even though you're going to give it away, right? Because the box comes on your front porch, you run out there, oh my gosh, I got a box, I got a box, and you go and you pick it up, and you're like, who's it for me? And it's got your name on it, and you're like, yeah, and you know you ordered it, but still, it's, it's the whole experience that... Hey, yo, you can even have them wrap it for you if you want to, you know, and make it feel like it's yours, but then you got to give it away. Um, Olin, I disagree with you. I've got my wife this year a crock pot, and um, I'm kidding. I did not get her a crock pot because you're exactly right. Now, I, I did that one Christmas, honestly. I got my wife. She, she was, and I, I got this 12, 15 service, so I can get a little extra. Um, I, we, uh, <clears throat> funny story. She's not here. She, um, she, I just tell you, funny, funny. So we're walking through. This was years and years ago, early on. Okay, so newlyweds, listen to what I'm talking. Men, listen to what I'm saying. Um, if you want to stay married for a long time, listen to what I'm saying. And so we're walking through this mall, and uh, we go in this, conven- this store, and we're walking through. It's Christmas time, you know, Christmas trees everywhere like that. And, I, you know, I'm looking for hints. I don't know about guys like me, but I'm always looking for a hint from my wife. Like, what does she want? She's hard to buy for. I mean, she's got everything. You know, I can't buy clothes for her because I always mess that up. I can't buy shoes because I always mess that up. And so anyway, so I'm, you know, I'm just looking for any hints. And we go through the store. And at the end of the aisle, they have this, I mean, jamming crock pot. I mean, it's like, a, it's like four crock pots in one package. It's like a big one, and then it's got a medium-sized one, and then it's got a little one. And she goes, oh, my gosh, look at this thing. This is amazing. I'm thinking ding, 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 hint, hint, hint. Okay? So, I, I, you know, she, we go. I go back the next day. I buy the crock pot. It's a big box, you know, so I think I'm doing good. Wrap it, put it under the tree. Not good. Okay? She opens that present. She goes, this is the worst gift I've ever gotten in my entire life. I'm like, honey, but you said you want it. She goes, yeah, but I didn't want it for Christmas. So anyway, anyway so I'm with you, man. It was, I thought it was personal, you know. I thought it was real good, but anyway, I blew it, you know. She still loves me, though. Praise the Lord. Hey, uh, next weekend is a great, this week, this whole week is such a great opportunity for you to invite your friends, your coworkers. Uh, Can I just tell you that this is the time of year where people are so ripe for the gospel. Their hearts are open. Their minds are just receptive. um, The the barriers are down. And I really want to encourage you to to get out there face-to-face, invite some people. We've armed you with some cards where you can invite them. Uh, We've given you signs to put in your yard. But really, take some time. And, and, and what happens, I'm, I'm telling you, it is so amazing. And I give you permission at one of the services, and make sure you come with them. And I've had several people already tell me they're bringing their family, and they got people in their family that have never been to church before. Bring them, bring them, bring them. We, we have a special service that we're doing. We have all kinds of cool stuff outside. So you can totally manipulate them by telling them all the cool stuff that are coming. And they go, oh, by the way, we got to go in here for about an hour, and then we'll be done. But bring them. Um, During the services, I give you permission to keep one eye open during the altar call. Watch, because I'm telling you, when you see somebody raise their hand that you invited to give their heart to Jesus, there is nothing more exciting than that. It will change your life forever. Amen? And so make sure you invite some people. Uh, We're in a series called Evergreen. And we just have a couple more weekends where we're in this. If you have your Bible, turn to Psalms 92. Psalms 92. And I want to continue this, and we've had a great time talking about some different things. I'll give you a little review, and we'll talk about how to manage seasons that we have in life, how to stay fresh, how to stay steady, how to stay evergreen during the seasons. The Bible says in Psalms 92, verse 12, it says, the righteous, everybody say the righteous. Now, he's talking about us, those of us that have made a decision to become follower of Jesus Christ, the righteous, those are in right standing with God. The good thing about righteousness is it's not something that we can earn. 
Uh, it, basically, Jesus paid for that price. He, he gave us, through his grace, through his mercy, the ability through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, that's what we celebrated today with our communion, to come before him without any shame, without any guilt. Not because of our works, but because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. So it says, the righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. If you didn't know, a palm tree is an evergreen tree. Now the interesting thing about palm trees is they have what's called a ball root system. They have a root system that goes deep and it doesn't go out. It just has a ball that draws nutrients from the ground. So a palm tree can actually survive in the middle of the desert because of its root system. So the righteous shall flourish like a palm tree means that no matter what kind of heat you're facing in life, because of your righteousness, you can flourish. You can make it. The Bible goes on to say, he shall, that righteous person, shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Now, if you study the scripture, there's a lot of times where that phrase is used, cedars of Lebanon. David built his house. The, the house of God uh, that Solomon built was built out of cedars from Lebanon. Interesting thing about these cedars, um, these cedars actually grow at a high altitude, around three to 6,000 feet above sea level. Meaning that even if you're going through successful seasons in your life, that you can still have an opportunity to grow. Then the Bible says those, talking about those righteous people, who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of God. Aren't you thankful for a good church? Come on. Aren't you thankful that we got a great church that you can plant yourself into? Now, if you're new here, if you're a guest here, I want to encourage you. If, this, if, this isn't, if you don't have a home church, to make sure you plant yourself. Because I don't believe that you can stay steady, flesh, fresh, and flourishing in a season of challenge without being planted in a church. You need other people. We are better together. And so it says, those that are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They, talking about those same righteous people, shall bear fruit in old age. They'll, they'll create legacy. They shall be fresh and flourishing to declare. Why, why, why is all this important? So we can declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. So this whole series, Evergreen, is pointing to the reality that we have an aroma Nothing like, I love walking into the room that I have my Christmas tree in because it just, man, it just, that smell, that evergreen smell is so powerful. Well, you have a smell to you, and we want that, and I believe all of us want to have that aroma that is attractive to people in the seasons that we face. And we go through tough seasons, and we found out that there's basically two seasons that we face, either the seasons we like or the seasons we don't like, right? Right? How many of y'all are in some seasons you like? You're like, it's a good season right now. Like, you just met a nice-looking man, and he's actually got a job this time. Come on, somebody. Like, ooh, Jesus. You know, I know it's at McDonald's, but he's working. And, and or you met a girl, and she likes you, and all that good stuff. Or, or maybe you're going through a bad, how many of y'all going through a tough season, one that you don't like? You know, probably mo- a lot of us are going through tough seasons. Well, I love looking at Jesus because he actually demonstrates what it looks like to have what I call non-anxious presence. He's able to stay steady in the times where most people would be unsteady. One of the things they teach you in ministry school is they, and I, I, didn't, I went through a couple classes of ministry school, but I've learned over uh, years of experience that it's important in tough emotionally uh, charged times to be the one in the room who practices non-anxious presence. Because people are looking to a leader, they're looking to someone who is not reactive to a problem. And when you look at Jesus' life, the three and a half years that we see, he never is at a place of unrest, is he? He's never anxious, he's never edgy, he's never like, you know, snappy. Even when he cleans the temple out, there's intentionality. Um, even when he's faced with hard, challenging times, he, he's able to make it. We've been talking about how through hope, confident expectation of good, confident that, that anything is possible with God, expectation that the best is yet to come, that, that we have a good father who loves us, 
through peace, you know, understanding peace, that we, we will never experience true peace apart from a relationship with Jesus Christ. And today what I want to talk about is I want to talk about love. Next uh, week on Saturday night, at our, uh, Saturday during our, our Christmas Eve service, I'm going to talk about how to unwrap joy. Um, that happiness is, is nice to have, but it doesn't last. Joy is eternal. That we can experience joy by unwrapping things and, and dealing with the thieves of joy. But I want to talk to you today about love because I believe love is an important component in order to practice non-anxious presence. In order to deal with those times, those seasons that we don't like, we like, you know, like, like, like Christmas dinner with your family. Come on, it's going to be challenging. That's why I invite my family to Christmas dinner. I'm just with, with my kids and my wife and that's it, nobody else. You know, and some of us, we got all kinds of, we got some crazy family. Don't we? Come on, don't be, be honest. Like, it's all right. It's all right to be honest in church. Just like, I got some crazy, you know, we got the Democrats and the Republicans. They all come from, and then there's the converse, that awkward conversation where somebody brings it up, and you're like, hey, have another eggnog. And then Uncle Joe gets drunk, and then that, it just it all goes downhill from there. So we got to learn how to love. And the word that the Lord kind of gave me around this is uncommon love. Uncommon. The word uncommon means rare it means out of the ordinary, extraordinary, unusual, remarkable. And when I was thinking about this, I mean, there's so many different directions you can go with love. I mean, we could spend a whole year talking about the love of God, how he loves us, and what he did for us. But the verse that jumped out at me is Matthew chapter 22, right in the middle where Jesus has the potential to be unsteady. The religious that would chase him around, always trying to trip Jesus up, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Herodians, they would all come and mess with Jesus, and they're asking him all kinds of questions in this chapter. You can look previous to what I'm going to read to you and see they're asking him about taxes, they're asking him about the resurrection, um, they, they've challenged him on divorce, and it says that the Pharisees hear this in verse 34. Look at this with me. It says, Matthew 22, verse 34. It says, but when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees with his reply, they met together to question him. And what they did is they got their best guy, like the, the super Pharisee. One of them, an expert in religious law. Now look at me for a second. It's, our expert in religious law is a guy who, he, he, he has memorized the Bible. Now, I'm sure many of us have memorized some scriptures, but think about it. He's memorized the Bible. I'm talking Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. I mean, when's the last time you read Leviticus? I mean, you get to Leviticus, you go, Genesis, love Genesis, awesome. Joseph, Noah, Abraham, Exodus, Moses. Then we get to Leviticus, and you're like, can I just skip this book? I don't want to read Leviticus. And then we jump ahead in our Bible reading plan. We're like a 30 days ahead of time. He memorized it. He knows it. He can quote it. And so an expert in religious law tried to trap him with this question. So he asked him this question. Teacher, Jesus, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? In other words, what's the most important thing in life? Jesus didn't hesitate. He's practicing non-anxious presence. Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And I'm sure everybody's like, woo, yeah. All, all the fans of Jesus are like, woo, nailed it, Jesus. Go, Jesus, go. You know, they're like holding signs up. You demand, Jesus. Awesome. But he didn't stop right there. He could have stopped. And honestly, for us, it would have been great if he just stopped right there because it's easy to love God. You say, well, what do you mean it's easy? We don't have to face God face to face. But he didn't stop there. Matter of fact, he says in verse 39, a second is equally important. Let me just put this in context for you. The first commandment is to love the Lord your God. Very important. But the second is just as important, love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law. Everything you've studied, brother, everything you've memorized, bro, the entire law, all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. These are the most important things 
in life. Love God and love people. Now, this was hard for the Pharisees, the religious, because they liked the love God part, but they didn't really want to be around people. Matter of fact, they created laws in order to separate themselves from people. And Jesus was saying that we need to strike a balance between the two. 100% love for God, but also 100% love for people. I've said this before. Don't tell me how much you love God if you don't love people. So we got to make sure that we balance these two. We blend these two in our lives. Matter of fact, if you have a, a disproportionate love for God and people... I love God, but I leave people out of the equation. Let me tell you what happens. In my experience, people get weird. When they isolate themselves away from people, they become weird. They become irrelevant. They become judgmental, legalistic, and ultimately, they become very religious. On the other side of the table, if we put our, a disproportionate amount of love for people and not enough for God then we begin to compromise our relationship with God for the sake of people or the cause of helping people. And so when you think about love, it's, it's kind of a hard word. Like, like Olin was talking about, it's a hard word to define. Now the Bible, you, you know the Bible, Old Testament, Hebrew, original written, translated into English, New Testament, Greek written, translated into English. The Bible uses many different words to describe love because the Greek language is more descriptive than the English language. A lot of people have a hard time learning from another language, English, because specifically around words like love. Like I could say, I love cheeseburgers. And then I say, I love my wife, right? And you just know, you know that there's nothing better than a good cheeseburger. That's a joke, by the way. But you understand that when I say those two, you know I don't mean the same thing. I'm using the same word to describe my love for a cheeseburger and my love for a wife. But you understand because of the English language that the object of the love determines the intensity of the word. So you know I love my wife more than I love cheeseburgers. See, in the Greek language, different words describe love in a different way. For example, the word that Jesus uses to describe loving God and loving people is the Greek word agape. Agape, which means unconditional love, a love that has no conditions around it. And only God can operate in an unconditional form. People say all the time, you need to have unconditional love. Well, just so you know, because of our sin, we're incapable of full-on, 100% unconditional love. But there's also a Greek word called philios. Philios is a word that means brotherly love. So in the Bible, many times it'll talk about this relationship between people. Two, two guys, man, I love you, bro. I love you, bro. Okay, that's not, that's not agape love, nor is it, it, is it eros love, which I'll explain in a second. It's philios love. It's where we get words like Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. And then the, word, the other word that's used most often in the scripture, agape philios, is eros. Eros is a passionate love. It's where we get words like erotic from. Three different words. They all are translated love, but they all have a different meaning. When I think of love, and I thought a lot about this this week, I think of sacrifice. I think of generosity. I think of forgiveness. I think of loyalty, faithfulness. When I think of love, when I think of uncommon, rare, extraordinary love, those are the words that jump out to me. And I, I believe this. I believe that life, according to what Jesus just told us in Matthew chapter 22, life is really just one giant lesson of learning to love. Now let me break this down for you because this is important for us to know. Every test, let me, let me say it another way. Every season that you're going through, the season you're in right now, you know what the test that God has for you in that season? It's one of two things. It's either God trying to teach you to love him more or God trying to teach you to love someone else more. That's all it is. 
So you can narrow all of the challenges that you're facing in your life. Every prayer challenge that you have right now. God, why haven't you answered my prayer the way I want you to answer it? It's because God is trying to teach you to love him despite how he answers your prayer. Doesn't matter. Do you still love God? Well, what if it doesn't happen? What if the thing, and we all have situations that don't change. Well, why is that? Why is it that I keep having to face the same issue over and over and over again? The lesson is God wants you to learn to love him in spite of what you see with your eyes. In spite of what you're dealing with in your life. The other side of the coin is true too. It also involves people. Lord, why haven't you moved me? I don't want to work at this job anymore. My boss is blank, you know. <laughs> don't fill in the blank right now, you know. It's because God wants you to learn to love people more. Doesn't that help you? Help me. Help me understand. See, it also let me know that the best use of my life is to love. The purpose of my life. If Jesus said the two most important things to remember, the two most important commandments that we have are to love God and to love people, then all of my life should flow through those two commandments in some way, shape, or form, right? The purpose of my life. Man, I'm telling you what, this message will challenge you today. It challenged me. I'm preaching to myself just as much as I'm preaching to you today because I need to learn how to love. I need to recognize that the best use of my life is to love. So here's a couple thoughts around how to use your life the best. Are you ready? Okay, uncommon love, write this down, uncommon. By the way, uh, we all know that if you take notes, it's a way more better chance for you to get into heaven. I'm just letting you know that. Somebody told me outside in the um, lobby in between this service and the last service, they said, uh, hey, Troy, I just want to let you know, I took notes, I'm going to heaven. I said, you are on your way, brother. And so, so take some notes down. So here's the first thing. If, if the best use of my life is to love, what is the best? What are some good ways that I can use my life? Well, first of all, I need to understand that uncommon love, rare, extraordinary, unusual love is the mark of a true believer. It's the mark of a true believer. Love is what validates my faith. Let me explain this. Love is what authenticates my faith. Love is what certifies my faith. Going to church doesn't prove I'm a Christian. Okay? Tithing doesn't prove I'm a Christian. Serving doesn't prove I'm a Christian. What? You mean serving? Quoting scripture, praying real good, going to life group doesn't prove you're a Christian. Why? Because you can do all those things out of obligation. With no love. You can just show up. You can even be hateful doing it. And I've met a few Christians that show up to church, and they ain't very nice. Some of y'all may have met some on the way into the parking lot. Even if it's church, they're like, I'm taking your spot. <laughs> no, love is what proves my relationship with God. It's the motivation behind all those actions that proves the genuineness of my faith. Um, I love to travel, and one of the first trips, the first trip I ever went on was to Russia. I was going to preach. I, I'd never preached before, and my pastor from Richmond said, hey, Troy, why don't you go to Russia? Uh, I guess he was trying to get rid of me. And so I want you to, this was in the, in the mid-90s, okay? This was just after the communist wall had fallen down. This was before they started hacking the United States, stuff like that. And so, <laughs> that was a little jab there, just in case you're listening, Putin. So, uh, <laughs> you never know, he could be watching. <laughs> and so, I, I go, and it, I, I've still got the message that I preached in my notes. I keep every, every one of my messages I've ever preached. So, I've got the notes. It was a terrible message. I'm telling you, it was so bad, they never invited me back. It was bad. I mean, really bad. And so I go and preach. I spend two weeks there. I have a friend that, that was over there who started a Bible school. We had, we had a church over there, all kinds of crazy. It was great. And so we go. I, 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 on my way back, they take me to, I went to Moscow, went to St. Petersburg, went to all these different places. And so I am, um, they're taking me to the airport so I can go back to the United States. 
and I, um, uh, they drop me off, and I'm like, hold on a second, is anybody going to stay with me like, while I'm here? And they go, no, we got to get back. So they drop me off. I know no Russian, okay? I, I don't know how to dial. I don't even know like a phone. How do you, I don't have any money. And so they drop me off, and they say, yeah, all you got to do is go through those doors, and there'll be a little gate where some people are going to meet you, and then you'll get on the plane. Everything's good. I'm like, uh, okay. And I've never traveled before, never been on a plane before other than when I flew over there. I got all my bags. They drop me off, and I start walking. I get through the first set of doors, and there's these guys standing there with these M16s. I mean, they're just like, and they got that Russian. Whatever you can picture in your mind about a Russian soldier, that is that person. <laughs> okay. Just think, that is that person. And I get there, and they, they look at all my papers, and they go, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Mr. Maxwell, you cannot leave. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, hold on a second. You mean I can't, what do you mean I can't leave? No, you cannot leave. You must stay in Russia. Your visa is no good. I'm like, whoa. So I go into emergency tongues, emergency <laughs> prayer. You ever have those emergency moments? You're praying stuff. You're like, you're, for, you're asking God to forgive you of sins that maybe three of your relatives committed, you know, trying to... I want to go home, man. I don't want to stay in Russia. You know, I, I'm like, this is crazy. And then I remember they haven't looked at my passport, so I reach in my back pocket, and I pull out my passport, and I don't get any farther than about right here, and they go, oh, you're an American. <laughs> go on through. They let me through just because I have my passport, just because I validated who I was. That's what love does. Love is the validation of your Christianity. Just try, just try on Monday to go into your bank, walk up to the teller, and go, I want my money. My name is whatever, just say your name. And just go, I want it right now. I have money in this bank. Give me my, give me my money right now. They're going to call the police on you immediately. <laughs> Unless you pull out your ID. Because that's what validates who you are. Listen, I can't tell you how important it is in the world that you and I live in that we live a demonstrated love kind of life. Just saying I go to church, just saying the right words, it's not going to cut it anymore when it comes to reaching people, when it comes to loving God and loving people. 1 John chapter 4, verse 20, it says, If we say we love God but hate our brothers and sisters, we are liars. Now, don't send me a bad email. I didn't write it, okay? <laughs> For people cannot love God whom they have not seen if they do not love their brothers and sisters whom they have seen. Because, my, because love is what initiated my relationship, my walk with God. Guess what? Love is what displays my walk with God. Galatians 5, verse 6. The only thing that counts, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. So uncommon love is the mark of a true believer. Secondly, uncommon love, if the best use of my life is love, what does that look like? Uncommon love compensates for sin. Compensates for sin. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. Above all things, notice the, the general thing. Notice, notice the, the absolutes that the Bible is using here. Above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. We live in a very judgmental, competitive, comparison type world. But the Bible tells us love will cover a multitude of sin. I think there's, this means two different things. First of all, I believe it means that Jesus covered our sin. Now the word cover here is not just to throw a blanket over. Actually, it's the Greek word crypto, where we get words like encrypt from. If you want to send a message to somebody and you don't want other people to see it, then you encrypt, you hide that message. The word crypto means to hide, conceal. It means to bury. When I think of this love covering a multitude of sin, I think of Jesus on the cross. Because the Bible tells me that he became sin. In other words, he took my past, my present, and my future mistakes upon himself, and he covered them. He took the rap for you and me. 
See, it wasn't the cross that killed Jesus. It wasn't the, the beating. It wasn't the crown of thorns. It wasn't the nails in his hands and the nails in his feet. No, it was our sin that was laid upon him. That is what caused Jesus to die. It was the separation between him and his father. That's why he cried out in that moment, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's what killed Jesus was the separation from his father. He, he experienced physical and spiritual death because he became sin for you and me. Your sin, past, yesterday's mistakes, present, today, and guess what? What you're going to do tomorrow and the next day and next month and next year, Jesus has already paid for it for you. Love covers a multitude of sin. You know what else? Love covers a multitude of sin because of that. I can cover someone else. I can help someone deal with their sinful nature. I, I can't pay for their sins. Jesus already did that. But you know what I can do? I can cover. My son played football um, like 12 to about 14 or 15. He played all the way up until his 10th grade year. The first football team he played for was the Lake Norman Giants. There was just a little uh, intramural team played on Saturday. I loved to go to the games. It was so much fun. I mean, these kids didn't know what they were doing. They were just trying to figure out their bodies, you know, and hitting, and they didn't want to hit. But what would happen is, is they would tackle. One guy would tackle, and the whole defense would jump on top of him. They got so excited about actually getting somebody on the ground, everybody just jumped on them. So the referees would blow their whistle, no pile on, no pile on, no pile on. Imagine what church would be like if somebody came in with their problems and we didn't pile on. We treated them with love. Love covers, hides, conceals a multitude of sin. Jesus demonstrated this in a powerful reflection in John chapter 8. Let me just paraphrase the story for you. Jesus is preaching in church. He's having this meeting in church, doing like a little Bible study. And all of a sudden, right in the middle of his message, the, the, the religious bring this woman, the Bible tells us, who is caught in the act of, of sin. She is caught in adultery. I mean, this is TVMA. All right? This is, this is serious, like, I mean, serious business. Caught throws this woman who's caught in adultery at, her feet, at his feet, looks at Jesus and says, what are you going to do about it? How are you going to handle this? Law says that she should be stoned. Now, I want you to catch this because this just wasn't about this woman. This was about Jesus too because Jesus was uh, born of a woman who wasn't married when she was pregnant. Meaning that, that Jesus is being attacked and they're throwing this woman at, at his feet saying, yeah, this is exactly like your mom. How would you handle it? How, how are you going to deal with this? The Bible says that Jesus got down on his knees, started writing some stuff on the ground. We don't know what he wrote. Maybe he wrote the guy's name that should have been there too. Hello. Because they don't, they, he's not mentioned in the whole equation. And, and it says this. It says that when Jesus, when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. Everybody say, love covers. Love say it one more time. Say, love covers. love covers. Then he gets back down on his knees. And the Bible says, from the oldest to the youngest, they start walking away meaning all of them have sinned. By the way, Jesus could have picked up a rock and thrown it at her because he had no sin. And then it says in John chapter 8, verse 10, he raised himself up again and said to the woman, saw no one but the woman and said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? He, she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. What I love about this his love covers a multitude of sin. He spoke for her before he spoke to her. See, this is how we redeem people who are struggling with sin in their life. If you want to see somebody's heart open up, who's dealing with problems in their life, who's dealing with sin in their life, speak for them. Cover them. Listen, let's... 
Let's let God deal with the sin. He'll deal with it. Okay? Let's let God deal with the sin. We, we don't need to be the Holy Spirit. He's good at his job. He will do fine. Let's just love the sinner. Well, well, no, no that's not what I was taught. We need, to, we need to tell them what they're doing wrong, and we need to like, just put them in front of the church and have them confess their sins. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Bring them on up here, and we'll just, we'll just fry them. Because if we don't tell them, they're going to hell. Listen, I've met a lot of young girls who've made some mistakes in their life, gotten pregnant, but the last thing I was going to do is tell them how wrong they were. I think they understand how wrong they are. What I want to do is I want to cover them, protect them, so they can, they, can, they can know that someone loves them. Are you following me? Love covers a multitude of sin. Can I get an amen in here? All right. I'm almost done. James 5, verse 20. It says, let him... Know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Just remember, before you start pointing the finger at someone else, just remember that we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Uncommon sin, here, here's number three. Uncommon sin takes action. We know this verse. Everybody's heard this verse. Even if you haven't been in church, you've probably been to a wedding and you've heard this verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You can't preach on love and not talk about 1 Corinthians 13. Even if you've never heard this verse, you've seen it on your grandma's wall, crocheted. Right? And if you haven't seen it on grandma's wall, crocheted, it's because she's making you one this year for your wall. Love suffers long and is kind, does not behave rudely. Love does not parade itself. Love is not puffed up, does not behave, uh, does not seek its own, is not provoked. Love thinks no evil. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Isn't that an awesome verse? Don't you love that verse? I mean, it makes you just get all excited. Like, yeah, you want to see somebody get married. Just love it. I just love that chapter. Did you know when Paul wrote this? He wasn't writing because they were at a wedding. No, this church was jacked up when he wrote this letter. When he wrote this particular chapter, they were struggling in their motivation. They didn't know why. They, they had lost the why behind their Christianity. And as a result, they were committing adultery and idolatry and, and incest and all kinds of craziness. And then Paul just interjects right in the middle of these two books of the Bible, these two letters to the Corinthian church. You need to love. That the motivation behind who we are is love. Now, we know this. We know in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, the Bible tells us that God is love. So we can take it a step further, can't we? And we can say God is kind. God suffers long. God does not envy. God does not parade himself. God is not puffed up. We're like, yes, I love God. God is so awesome. He is love. Woo! But let me, let me challenge you. Let me challenge you with something. Ephesians 5 verse 1 says this, be imitators of God walking in love. So here's what I want to kind of challenge you, application of uncommon love. If it takes action, how about we start with ourselves? So in your note sheet, if you want to flip over to the second page, I wrote out this whole chapter, this whole Verse for you, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8. And I left a blank in front of every quote. I don't want you to write your husband's name down there. I don't want you to write your wife's name down there. Or someone you think should be at church today. I want you to write your name in there. I wrote my name in there. Here's what it says about me. Troy suffers long. Patient. Troy's patient. Well... I'm already messed up. Like, I'm already convicted. <laughs> Troy is kind. Well, most of the time I'm kind. Troy does not envy. Troy does not parade himself. Troy is not puffed up. Troy does not behave rudely. Troy does not seek his own. Troy is not provoked. Troy thinks no evil. Uh-oh. Come on, I'm getting convicted. Right? I want, come on, right now, I want you to write your name. Write your name in there. I didn't bring a pen. Borrow one from somebody next to you. Write your name in there. 
Because this is my challenge. In entering into 2017, how about we make this applicable to our own lives? Uncommon love. Love God. Love people. The best use of my life is to love. Troy bears all things. Troy believes all things. Troy hopes all things. Troy endures all things. Troy is faithful. He never fails. He's loyal. Man, what a great confession to make over your, your life. You say, I, I can never live up to this. Well, just keep confessing it because you'll be surprised how every day that confession will begin to change your outlook on life on how you see God, how you pass the tests, the lessons of love, of loving God and loving people. Amen? Paul went on to say after he finished this chapter, here's what he says in 1 Corinthians 14. He says, eagerly pursue and, uh, and seek to acquire love. Make it your aim, your greatest quest. Jesus, most important commandments, love God, Love your neighbor, love others. And here's the last thing I want to say. The best use of my life is understanding that uncommon love pursues. Uncommon love pursues. Um, I wanted to finish with this because I had an opportunity this week to have, have lunch with a guy by the name of Eric. And um, it was... I was with some pastor friends of mine at Chipotle. I love Chipotle. How many of y'all love a little burrito bowl, extra chicken? I know people give Chipotle a bad rap. Just pray over your food. You'll be fine. You'll be fine. Use your faith, brothers and sisters. I love to work out, and then I'll go eat Chipotle. I mean, I could, I'm going to go today. Matter of fact, I'm already craving it right now. Like, when I leave here, I'm going to go to Chipotle and get some lunch because I just love Chipotle. So I was in there with some buddies of mine after we worked out, some pastor friends of mine, and this gentleman was behind us, and he goes, hey, how you doing, pastor? And, and he, he had knew my, my friend, gone to his church, and, and so we start talking and find out he's Eric. He's been saved for about a month, about 30 days, been saved. And so I said, hey, Eric, why don't you come join us for lunch? I buy his lunch for me. He goes, oh, really? Thank you so much. And, and so we sit down. I said, so, hey, Eric, can you tell me your story? I want to know your story. Tell me what happened 30 days ago. Why are you so excited? I mean, what, what's, what's going on? And he goes, well, he goes, do you have a few minutes? Because I want to tell you the whole story. And I said, sure, man. Let's, let's have some lunch. Let's talk about this. He says, I, I've lived in this area for about three and a half years. And the reason I moved here uh, with my family was because I met this girl. And we started dating. And we actually had been dating for about three and a half years until about a month ago I found out that she was having an affair with her boss. She was sleeping with one of her co-workers. And I was devastated. Now, for the last three and a half years, I'd been going to get my hair cut at this lady's place. And, and uh, I would go, you know, every four, four to six weeks. And this girl would invite me to church every single time. And I would tell her the same thing three and a half years. I would tell her, saying, I'm an atheist. Like, I don't believe in God. Um, I, I don't, I don't want to believe in God. I don't know why you keep asking me about God. I'm not going to come to your church. And he, he would say it over and over and over again. However, she obviously had given a good haircut because he kept going back for three and a half years. <laughs> and every time he would show up, they would start talking, and, and she would invite him to church. Say, hey, you need to come, you need to come, you need to come. Constantly, three and a half years until a month ago. He found out that his girlfriend was having an affair. However, that day, he had to go get his hair cut. And guess what happened? He's there, and you know what you do with your hairdresser. You tell all your heart. You know, you sit down with your hairdresser, you just spill your guts out, you know, because they're like psychologists who cut hair. <laughs> they're awesome. And so he starts spilling his heart, and you know what she says? Hey. Why don't you come to church with me this weekend? Three and a half years, man. Why don't you come to church with me this weekend? He's like, I don't want to come to church with you. My heart's broken. And she says, what's the worst thing that could happen if you come to church? What's the, what's the worst thing? The worst thing that could happen, Eric, is nothing. Like, you could go to church and nothing could happen. Now, she knew in her heart that something was going to happen. Because, see, uncommon love pursues Uncommon love doesn't give up. 
Just like God in our life, he doesn't give up on us. He doesn't quit on us. Even if we keep shutting the door in his face, slamming the door in his face, even if we keep running, the faster we run, the faster he runs. Whenever we hide, he always seems to find us. And it's just in that right moment, that right second, and maybe you're in this place today and you're like Eric. And it was the right moment in his life. He was at a place that he was at his lowest. And she said, why don't you come to church? And guess what he did? He came to church. An atheist came to church. And his greatest fear, listen, his greatest fear was loneliness. And guess what was preached on the day that he went to church? Overcoming your fears. And it was in that moment, in the middle of that message, that he realized God is real. That he could put all the three and a half years of this young lady inviting him over and over to church, over and over, that God, the one he didn't believe in, was actually the one who had been pursuing him for these three and a half years. Even longer than that, he started to put things together where things were happening in his life. And then at that moment, he stood up and he gave his heart to Jesus Christ a month ago. Got baptized a week later immediately started serving with visitors that came into the church. Isn't that awesome? Can I just tell you, wherever you are in your life, you have a God who's been pursuing you. He's been chasing you down. And you know how much He loves you? All you got to do is look at the cross this much. He cares about you. His arms are open wide for you. You know why? Because you can't give what you don't have. And God wants to give you all of who he is. Just like we sang today, he doesn't give you himself in pieces. He gives all of himself. And he did it on Calvary 2,000 years ago. And he's been chasing you down ever since. Maybe today's the day where you do like Eric. Maybe you haven't believed, but all of a sudden it just made sense. Oh, oh, look look at this situation and this situation and this person and this person. You know why? Because God wants to release you of the pain of the sin that you've been involved in. He's got such a great plan for your life, a future for your life. Matter of fact, why don't you just bow your head and close your eyes right where you are. If you're here in this room today, maybe you're watching, listening online, and you want to get right with God. You know you're fallen far back. Maybe you've, maybe, maybe you've sinned and missed the mark, made mistakes. You want, to, you want to start a brand new life with Jesus. You can start it today. All you got to do is just say yes to him. Because here's what's happening right now. Your heart is probably about to beat out of your chest right now. If you're in this place and you say, you know what? I I I need to get right with God. That's the presence of the Holy Spirit drawing you in. See, this is what separates Christianity from every other religion on the planet. Is you have a God who's searching for you. He's seeking for you. He's been looking for you. And you can't ever hide from him. And he's knocking on the door of your heart. And all you got to do is let him in today. Matter of fact, if you want to start a new relationship with Jesus Christ today, you want to start right now, right in this moment, right now, I want you just to, just, I'm going to count, matter of fact, I'm going to count to three. When I get to three, just raise your hand. You say, that's me. You want to give your life to Jesus. You want to give your life back to God. Maybe you served him at one time, but you fell away from him. Ready? One, two, three. Just raise your hand. You say, that's me. Thank you, Jesus. Hands all over the room. Just lift it up high so I can see it. If you lifted it up high, would you stand up right where you are? Just stand up. Just stand up right where you are. Just get on your feet. Just be bold. Just stand up. Thank you, sir. Who else? Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Just stand up right where you are. Church, would you stand with them? Just stand with them right now. Come on, give them a big hand. Isn't that great? Give them a big hand. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. Listen, if you stood up, you wanted to stand up. I want to pray with you. Matter of fact, we're going to pray. All of us together are going to pray a prayer together. Just say this with me. Let's say it out loud so you, loud enough so you can hear with your own ears. Say, Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus Christ died for me. I believe that his blood 
cleanses me, releases me of all my sin, all my shame, and all my guilt. Today, I start a new life. Today, I step into my purpose, my destiny. Thank you, God, for setting me free. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, give Jesus a big hand clap.